everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar this evening, the Early Stage Lung Cancer Advances in Diagnosis and Management. Uh, this is a session uh, that we're running in partnership with the Northern Hospital. Um, my name is Michaela. I'm the Manager of Workforce Development at Northwest Melbourne PHN and would like to welcome you to our session this evening. Uh, if my slide will move. Um, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land of which our work takes place. Um, for me, that's the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, the Boon Wurrung people and the Wathaurong people. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are in the session with us this evening. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So um, we are in a Zoom webinar session this evening, so you are all muted. Um, you'll see on your screen you've got um, a panel um, and one of the options there is the Q&A box. Um, so please put your questions in the Q&A box um, as we go through the session. Um, there will be time for questions at the end. Please feel free to put your questions in at any time and, and we'll be going through those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, this session is being recorded, um, so to um, uh, the questions will be asked anonymously to protect your privacy. So please feel free to ask any questions you like. Um, the other thing to let you know um, is if you'd like to claim CPD points for this session, um, we need to have your correct name. Um, so please ensure that you've joined the session using the name as your event registration um, or the same phone number if you've dialed in. Um, if you're not sure if your name matches, um, you can send a chat message to the um, NWM PHN Education um, and let them know of your correct name um, if you can't change it in the system. And we'll make sure that we've got that recorded. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, Dr. Bibushal Fapa is a thoracic surgeon. Um, he's currently head of thoracic, the thoracic surgery unit at the Northern Health. Um, he has extensive experience in surgery in patients with lung cancer, and his special interest is in minimal access thoracic surgery and lung preserving surgery for lung cancer. He's also keenly interested in clinical research and teaching and training juniors. He's completed a PhD in molecular biology of mesothelioma through the University of Melbourne. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Vishal Bulel. Uh, he's a full-time medical oncologist at Northern Health with a keen interest in the management of thoracic malignancies, as well as breast, genitourinary and gynecological cancers. Uh, Vishal graduated from the University of Melbourne and completed his advanced training in medical oncology in 2014 through Bendigo Health, Western Health and Monash Health. He then worked as a clinical fellow in early clinical trials at Monash Health and Ballarat Health Service before moving to Northern in 2021. Vishal is keen to continue improving outcomes for cancer patients and improving access to clinical trials at Northern Health. Our third speaker is Dr. Kanishka Rangamua. Uh, he's a respiratory physician and interventional pulmonologist with appointments at Northern Health and Royal Melbourne Hospital. He specialises in performing minimally invasive bronchoscopy to diagnose and stage lung cancer. Kanishka graduated from the University of Otago in New Zealand and completed his specialist training in respiratory and sleep medicine in 2018 through Eastern Health and the Alfred Hospital. Following his specialist training, he's he undertook further training in advanced bronchoscopy as a research and interventional fellow at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Kanishka's research interests are in interventional pulmonology and lung cancer, and he's currently completing a PhD through the University of Melbourne, assessing minimally invasive bronchoscopy treatments to, uh, treatment techniques sorry, in small cell lung cancer. And um, uh, this uh, little square is something that we'll all recognize. Um, this is a QR code for your feedback. Um, so we will share this um, in the slides at the end of the session, um, and I will remind you at the end about the, um, the feedback survey for the session. Um, so that's it for me. I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Vishal. I'll stop sharing my slides. Okay. Um, 
Thanks for that, Michaela. Um, so my name is Misha, I'm one of the oncologists at the Northern. Um, going to do this um, first part of the talk in two segments. The first part is just to talk about the health pathways. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Health Pathways provides clinicians with a single website, access to clinical referral pathways and resources at the point of care. Um, it's written by GP clinical editors with support from local GPs, hospital-based specialists and um, experts in the area. Um, gives medical-based advice uh, on latest evidence. It reduces variation in care and also gives you an idea of how to refer to the most appropriate hospital um, within your network and what services are also available. So the relevant pathways to the talks of today are the ones for lung cancer for established and suspected. Um, with regards to the lung cancer, lung, we'll talk about this more in a bit of detail, but lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in Australia. And um, despite changes in smoking habits, the actual incidence has not really altered overall in the last few years. Um, so the main thing is about who to look out for. And obviously having a heavy smoking history or occupational exposure to um, asbestos or heavy metals is um, quite important to um, rule out. But we'll go through this more in about the screening program, which will be coming up as well. Um, if there's any suspected um, red flag symptoms, hemoptysis, stride or respiratory distress, this is when they need to come into emergency department. But otherwise, if there is a suspicion, sorry, a suspicion of lung cancer on imaging, they need to be seen and referred urgently and seen within two weeks. Um, and so what that is, is that if there's uh, suspected lung cancer, we want them referred to a center that can provide a multidisciplinary meeting format. And that's within two weeks for um, their workup to get started. And then this leads on to how they're assessed and um, how their procedures will go on, which we'll talk about today. And um, with regards to management, unless they have an urgent symptom, it's about essentially accessing the point of care as early as possible to minimize any wait time. And, um, and this is how you can find more information about the health pathways. So I'm going to flick over. Uh, sharing this one and I'll share my next presentation, which is about screening. So this is a topical um, presentation, um, lung cancer screening, as it's recently been um, approved um, by the MSAC and been recommended for funding. So as I was talking about, lung cancer is the fifth most common cancer in Australia. There's an estimated over 14,000 cases will be diagnosed in 2022. And the incidence has stayed relatively stable. Um, it has declined in men, but risen in women, but the overall number has not changed. But even though it is the fifth most common, it is the leading cause of cancer death. The primary cause of this is late presentation, which accounts for about 42% uh, patients being diagnosed at stage four. Survival rates have increased from 10 to 22% in the past 30 years, partly due to um, improvement in techniques and systemic therapy, but not so much early detection. Um, and this is a slide that might come back tonight, but essentially showing that stage by stage, um, as you step down, the survival curve really starts to dramatically drop off. So the average survival for a stage 1A is that much, is the top three lines on your screen, and that's much, much better um, than everything else that comes after. And this is despite the therapies that are available. So the rationale for screening is that if we detect them at an earlier stage, they will have a better survival. And the main evidence from this comes from two large trials. The first one was um, uh, the NLST, which was done in the USA, and then a subsequent one called Nelson, done in the Netherlands and Belgium. So the evidence has been around for about 10 years, but the uptake of screening has been limited um, across the world. Just a few countries that have actually put not a fully funded system, but just a limited version of screening. Um, and a lot of that is down to um, cost effectiveness and whether there's any political appetite to put it through. 
So the NLST study enrolled 53,444 patients over 2002 to 2004, age of 55 to 74 with an over 30 pack year smoking history. And if there were former smokers quit less than 15 years prior, which is that high risk category of patient. It excluded patients with a prior lung cancer, hemoptysis or unexplained weight loss. Obviously this would make you think that these might be more advanced um, patients. And they were assigned to a yearly dose chest CD for three years versus just a chest X-ray. Um, and interestingly, they had an over 90% compliance with screening showing that there is interest from the population to have this done. Um, and their cancer detection rates, I've highlighted the top and the bottom box there, but essentially in a screening um, cohort, 51% were picked up at stage 1A um, versus in a non-screening, about 17% being picked up early. And so that would have been most likely through symptoms. And the stage four presentation for the ones who didn't have a true screening test was 42 to 44%, which is again, sort of very similar to our data of how patients present. Um, so obviously a successful at picking up earlier stage cancers. And so it led to a, re a relative reduction in rate of death from lung cancer by 20% with um, CT screening and a reduction in overall mortality from any cause by 6.7%, which at a population level is quite significant. The Nelson study was a Dutch and Belgian study and it recruited 13,000 men from 2003 to 2005. Women were initially excluded as they just could not, there wasn't, um, due to cultural differences, not a lot of women were um, having a high enough uh, smoking history to be included. Subsequently, they have actually done a subgroup with about 2,000 women, which mimicked the main study as well. So it was ages 50 to 74, more than 15 pack year history, so more conservative than the US data, and current smokers or quit less than 10 years prior. Um, excluded if they had severe health problems, inability to climb two flights of stairs, um, severely overweight or past cancer. And what they did was load a CT at year one, three, and five and a half versus no screening. And again, they had over 90% compliance. So again, I've highlighted stage one and stage four. So with a screening detected lung cancer accounts for 46% um, in 1A, which again, showing that screening is actually bringing forward the diagnoses for these patients. And in the control group, um, any lung cancer, uh, stage four at 45%. Again, very similar data to what ours is as well. So, and they had a relative reduction in rate of death from lung cancer by 24%. Um, and in a small sample of women, the reduction was actually 33%. So very compelling data, um, which has led to eventually this being looked at from the MSAC perspective, and they've proposed an Australian model for this. So they're proposing a screening age of 55 to 74 or 50 to 74 for um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. It's a low dose CT every two years. So no time limit on this. So basically until they're 74, it's every two year CT screening, um, except in current or former smoker, but the eligibility will be done through an actual formal assessment that gives out a six year risk score um, of lung cancer. And the target would be 1.51%. And also, formatting that smoking cessation needs to be an integral part of screening. And so um, essentially the actual assessment, the PLCOM 2012, just takes into account a few of their back, bit of their background as well as smoking history. There's a modified version of it that is also more useful that also gives that um, in an easier um, breakdown to give the six year risk of cancer. So essentially anyone who scores over 1.51% would then be eligible. Um, and this is how the system is designed to work. So identifying people at the start and then doing their risk assessment, if they actually meet the criteria, having a low dose CT every 24 months, and then based on what is found on that scan, um, reacting to it or continuing on surveillance. So if they have no findings continuing on the two yearly, uh, low malignancy risk will be a CT at 12 months, a moderate one at three months, and something that is high or suspected will get referred straight on to a um, specialist service with an MDT. So the pros of screening from my perspective is that earlier detection improves outcomes. I think we have that quite well set up in 
literature, combining with smoking cessation help improve long-term outcomes. So looking beyond just lung cancer, but at COPD, at um, vascular diseases as well. It also addresses inequity in healthcare and improves health outcomes for all because these programs will be more useful to people in a lower socioeconomic status and less health awareness. Um, and the knock-on effect over time will help reduce the burden of disease of other smoking related conditions. Um, in terms of the downside of it, false positives is something that we worry about, which is that having more um, lesions found that are non-malignant, that need more follow-up, adds more distress to the patients, adds an extra burden on the healthcare system, and also means that we might need to do more invasive procedures to investigate, which um, otherwise would not have been needed. It also has implications for workforce at every level to cope with the potential increase in numbers coming through it. Um, and I think that's my last slide about this. Um, and so I uh, will pass on to um, Bibushal if there's no questions. I think it's, uh, it's Kanishka. Uh, Kanishka next. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Let me just share the screen. So here we go. Um, so um, now uh, Vish, Vish has talked about sort of lung cancer screening and 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 the sort of um, the risks uh, associated with lung cancer. Now, I guess uh, one of the things that we should, we should address is, is how do we sort of diagnose and stage given that it's important to catch this early, but also to stage it appropriately. Um, so um, as part of this next bit, I'll, uh, I'll go through sort of nodule, a, a description around lung, lung nodules, lung masses, um, staging of lung cancer, and then methods of di uh, diagnosis and staging, particularly focusing on uh, bronchoscopy and intervocal ultrasound. Um, so, this is, the, I think you'll see a lot of this uh, slide um, over the course of the next hour. And again, it's to highlight that um, stage 1A lung cancer really does have that, um, that, that, that much better outcome, which uh, and, and so highlights the importance of catching a cancer early but, and then staging appropriately. And um, this fits in with what we've got as our uh, Cancer Australia of Optimal Care Pathways, where again, uh, a referral to a specialist um, from you guys when, when you catch a, a, a nodule should happen uh, within two weeks. Um, and then once uh, seen by a specialist, uh, we aim to diagnose and stage within two weeks um, of, 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 receive, of seeing that specialist. Um, when you talk about lung nodules, you've got a a very vast um, uh, array of, of, of spots that you can talk about. Um, so any spot in the lung less than three centimeters is called a nodule. And you can see that there are two pictures here, one of an eight millimeter nodule and another of uh, a nodule that's uh, 26 millimeters and um, quite significantly different in, in appearance and also implications uh, to the patient where this uh, lesion that's uh, 26 millimeters, you'd be a lot more worried about than the eight millimeter nodule. But there are other things that you do need to take into consideration. Um, a lung mass would be defined as a, as, a, as a lesion bigger than three centimeters. There's a very broad differential when we do see a spot like this on the lung. Um, it can range from lung cancer to, uh, to, 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 or to other malignancies such as carcinoid, uh, metastatic disease in some of the previous uh, other malignancies, or benign lesions such as hematomas. Um, other things that can uh, cause these are infections or inflammatory uh, lesions such as vascular, vasculitis or organizing pneumonia. So there's a very broad differential. Um, and some of the considerations that we take into account would be the size of the lesion, whether it's a completely solid lesion or if there is what we call a, a, a bit of a subsolid lesion with some ground glass or patchy areas to it. This imp impacts um, our poor process um, and also the number of lesions. And importantly, uh, thinking about exposures um, in terms of smoking, patient, uh, patient, and patient factors such as smoking history, family history of cancer, or previous cancer history. Now for small nodules, um, which is what we see a lot of, the Fleischner guidelines are sort of the stock standard approach um, to, um, uh, for, for nodules less than a centimeter. 
um, and the Fleischner guidelines uh, uh, provide um, fairly robust didactic recommendations uh, for both uh, solid and subsolid nodules. Um, and it's based on risk factors and um, again, it provides guidance for, uh, for, for, um, for surveillance. And most solid nodules you follow for up to two years, um, whereas most subsolid nodules you follow for up to, to four to five years. Um, now, um, what do you do when nodules are bigger than this? Then uh, we've got a few different considerations now. Um, PET scanning um, is where you use radio labeled glucose to look at activity of these nodules. Uh, you wouldn't recommend this for a nodule smaller than eight millimeters uh, because of the resolution of a PET scanner. And currently, Medicare will fund it for a solitary lung lesion where you cannot biopsy it or for staging the confirmed lung cancer. Uh, but ultimately, what you really want is tissue because um, this is going to determine uh, what this lesion is as well as um, help you with staging and prognostication if it is a lung cancer. There's a few different ways to consider. So one is CT gutter needle biopsy and the other uh, is um, uh, endobronchial ultrasound, which is an uh, advanced form of bronchoscopy. Now, um, you may argue that uh, some people, uh, there, there are some, some arguments to say, well, why would you not uh, consider surgery straight up off the bat if it's just a single lesion? And that's because there is a reasonably high rate of demand nodules um, in some studies up to 34%. This um, it's a CT data biopsy uh, is performed by our interventional radiologists. Um, it's a percutaneous approach, so it's a needle through the skin under local anesthetic and CT scanner to guide the needle. Um, this is, um, and then you can see that here, that's our nodule there. That's the tip of the needle, entry of the lesion just there. This is the patient's diaphragm, and that's the lung. Uh, so this is very useful for lesions in the periphery of the lung um, and can be associated with uh, nematoraces. And so um, the question is, what would you do for a lesion that's a bit more central? And this is where endobrochial ultrasound comes into play. Endobrochial ultrasound is a form of bronchoscopy where we combine the um, endoscopic images that you get from a bronchoscope as well as um, ultrasound images that you get from a ultrasound attached to the tip of the bronchoscope. And um, this is an excellent tool for both staging and diagnosis of lung lesions. It's performed under the conscious sedation, it's a day procedure with two forms. There's linear EBUS for the central lesions and lymph nodes, and radial EBUS for those more peripheral lesions. And it gives you pictures uh, like this, which I'll go to in a bit more detail. So with the radial EBUS, you have a bronchoscope, which is you know, a very fine telescope. It's about um, four millimeters in depth out of diameter. The ultrasound probe is a little wire that fits down the working channel, allows us to visualize uh, lesions in the peripheral uh, lung after we've navigated through the, through the distal airway. We can perform biopsies and um, some of our histological and psychological sampling uh, with our biopsies, and it's all fluoroscopy guided. Um, so, this is a patient with a lesion in their right upper lobe. Um, the bronchoscope is um, intubated through the trachea into the right lung and into the right upper lobe, then put in the um, radio EBUS probe out into the, um, into the airway that we think the lesion is in. And once, we, once it's in the lesion, we get this sort of distortion pattern where you can see this gray, um, this gray thing is, is with the lesion itself. Um, the fluoroscopy image here corresponds to this picture here, and you can see that this is the spot that of interest. Uh, once you've sort of localized this the area, you can then uh, perform biopsies with both their brush or forceps biopsies. Um, it's a reasonably accurate tool uh, with a sensitivity of 73% in the literature. Um, and the factors that will affect the accuracy of size when it's in, uh, lesions bigger than two centimeters generally have a higher rate of diagnosis location where lesions in the inner and middle third of the lung are easy to have, have a better rate of diagnosis. And a bronchus science that is the airway leading to that lesion. Um, when you compare radio EBUS to CT guided biopsies, most studies this is comparable. And this table is from a uh, local study performed about 10 years ago. Um, they, they compared EBUS um, guided transbronchial lung biopsy to CT guided percutaneous biopsy. And you can see that the diagnostic accuracy was relatively comparable. Um, so, in terms of decision making around how would you biopsy a, a nodule uh, of interest? Um, 
the simple algorithm would be something in the periphery, would be only for kids if you had a bar C, um, whereas uh, the more in the middle of inner one theater um, would, would offer a bronchoscopy um, as our first port of call. In terms of adverse events, um, the main thing to watch out for is in the thorax and this sits at about 1%. Um, with most radio bus uh, procedures. Um, and the majority of those would not require an intercostal catheter. The, the next thing I want to talk about is linear bus. Now, this is um, a slightly different bronchoscope because it's uh, just have a camera, it's got a little ultrasound on the tip of it, and uh, we can intubate this into the uh, larger airways. Um, and place this ultrasound adjacent to the large airway walls to um, identify both plant lesions and lymph nodes. Uh, we, then put a, uh, we can then use a needle to aspirate um, um, tissue from, from, the, from the lesion of um, lesion, lesion of interest. And this was first described in the late 2000s. Um, so indications to performing a linear rebus, uh, while well, linear rebus is for peripheral lesions, this is more for central lung lesions and for staging of lung cancers, as well as for the dissertation of mediastinal lymphadenopathy, which would also have a, a broad differential diagnosis. So um, this is a image of someone with um, a uh, left-sided lung lesion that's very avid on the CT, on the PET scan. That's why it's spread there. We, we can also see that on the uh, PET scan, there is a lot of mediastinal uh, act activity, avidity uh, of these mediastinal nodes. So these are all nodes that could be accessed with the uh, linear bus um, scope. This is a large central mass, uh, which again, when comparing the accuracy of the linear bus, this is, is, is comparable to this type of mass, could be for staging of uh, non small cell lung cancer, where the specificity is about 100% for both uh, the prep uh, and sensitivity, uh, sitting between 81 and 79% percent for both EBUS. In, uh, in most studies. Um, there have been several studies that have looked at uh, EBUS and compared it to mediastinoscopy, which was, which was used as a uh, benchmarking tool, and uh, most of the theory, most, uh, in all studies, was found to be comparable. Um, and again, you, you may ask why is this important? Because, and again, staging of lung cancer um, is important in terms of uh, ensuring we have adequate staging, uh, adequate um, improving our, our outcomes. In terms of lung cancer staging, um, you know, the stage 1As tend to do the best, and these are really uh, cancers uh, confined to the, um, to, to the ipsilateral lung. Uh, and so it's very important to ensure that uh, when you refer patients onto our surgeons that you've uh, looked at the the lymph nodes of interest and uh, ensure that they are not uh, not involved. Um, now, PET can be used to do this, but um, generally, EBUS is found to be more accurate. Um, the additional benefit of doing this bronchoscopically is that if you have a, a lung lesion that you want to diagnose, you can stage the mediastinum all at the same time. Uh, comparing PET scan PET scan to EBUS now. PET is what we use our um, go to tool for staging and has a sensitivity of between over 90% and 72%. Um, there has been one meta analysis, this is a meta analysis that was performed uh, by a group in Melbourne uh, comparing um, studies that have, uh, that have looked at PET versus um, linear EBUS for um, staging of um, the mediastinum. And what they found was that uh, in patients with uh, clinically you know, N0 or N1 disease, so just the uh, also predominantly um, cancer that was uh, confined to the ipsilateral lung, a subsequent EBUS demonstrated that in about 15% of cases, uh, they would upstage this to N2 and N3 disease, um, which has quite significant implications because these patients would not be suitable for surgery. Um, it also has a negative predictive value of about 90%, 91 percent the number they did a test to get these sorts of levels of seven. So it's, it's um, something that's worthwhile doing in terms of ensuring adequate staging of our patients. The universe is also good for other conditions, uh, sarcoidosis, lymphoma, and TB as well. Um, the last thing I'd like to mention is that uh, we with the Northern, um, we, um, our EOS service has been operational for since April of this year, offering both linear and radio EBUS 
perform two lists a week. And at the moment we have wait times of less than two weeks. So um, um, we're very, very excited to be providing the service to our local community. Uh, so my final take on message, um, early diagnosis and adequate staging is the key for getting the best outcomes for patients with lung cancer. Um, thanks. It's beautiful. Um, I'll stop sharing and uh, Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. I'll just try and share my screen. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you all for attending this webinar. My name is Vivrishal, and uh, my job today is to touch upon the recent developments in surgery for lung cancer as it relates to the local scenario. And yes, you're seeing this graph yet again. Uh, it is just to highlight that survival in lung cancer is dependent upon the stage at diagnosis and treatment. And complete surgical resection at an early stage gives the best chance of long-term survival to the patients. And, but surgical resection is usually only performed in stages up to stage 2b and in selected patients with stage 3a. But in Australia, sadly, only 18% of lung cancer patients are diagnosed at an early stage. And we've heard that 42% are diagnosed in stage 4. The present aspirations of lung cancer treating uh, surgeons and specialists around the world First and foremost is try and catch the cancers early. You've heard all about the screen, the progress of the screening process in Australia from VISH. There's also been a definite move towards uh, minimal access surgery and more recently towards a parent, lung parenchyma preserving surgery for early stage lung cancers that are suitable. But while the minimally invasive approach and the parenchymal preserving surgery approaches have been established to be of clinical benefit, they can only be applied when the cancers are diagnosed at an early stage. With improvements in the surgical techniques uh, and the adjunctive technologies, lung cancer uh, surgery has changed rapidly in the last five, few decades. The traditional thoracotomy that was uh, done was still required in some cases, but is associated with significant post-operative problems and especially post-operative pain and is now less favored. But the video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery of VATS in shot is typically done through a small access incision and uh, uh, that combined with two or three small ports around 10 to 12 millimeters in size and is now heavily favored, especially in early, lung, uh, early stage lung cancers. Updated results from the uh, Violet study that compared the uh, VATS lobectomies with open lobectomies showed that the improvements in pain in hospital uh, complications and, sh and the shorter hospital stay that was uh, seen in VATS was um, retained dis uh, the even with uh, the no compromise to the oncological outcomes at one year. In addition, the patients who underwent VATS had significantly improved physical function at five year, five weeks. Now, uh, uniportal surgery or uniportal VAT surgery is an advancement on VATS, wherein all the operation is done through a small hole, as you can see in the third picture. And this is, uh, gives the patient a faster recovery after surgery compared even to the VATS, uh, VATS lobectomy. Robotic surgery, or ro RATS as, it's, as it is called, gives the, the surgeon better ergonomics and probably a higher lymph node yield and has been taken up extensively throughout the world. The thoracic surgical service at the Northern Health is a growing service. Our trajectory in terms of lung cancer resections has been tempered by the recent pandemic, that is the COVID pandemic. However, we still do upwards of 20 lung resections for lung cancer, and we expect that this will, uh, this will rise in the years to come. But what is more notable is that nearly 55% of our lung resections that we've done in the past five years has been via a minimally invasive approach. 
When we break the numbers by the years, we can see that there is a clear shift towards minimally invasive approach, especially in the last three years. But what is also notable is that a significant proportion of patients will still require a thoracotomy because the primary tumors are relatively large or they're adherent to the chest wall. Recently, we compared our results with more established units at Western Health and Austin Health. Interestingly, our patients were slightly older and they had marginally lung functions, marginally worse lung functions rather, but the in hospital, the hospital 30 day hospital, uh, 30 day mortality and the post operative hospital stay was no different from the two uh, bigger units. We looked at the overall survival at and at a median follow up of 2.59 years, the median survival was not reached. Short to medium survival, that's uh, medium term survival data showed that it, this, it the results were similar to the units at the Western Health and Austin Health with this overall survival curves looking similar in all three units. Now, parenchymal preservation in lung cancer is an evolving and a very, very topical subject at the moment in, in thoracic surgery. Dr. Evarts Graham in 1933 performed the first curative resection of lung cancer he performed a pneumonectomy, that is, he removed the entire lung. By the 1960s, a lobectomy, that is, a removal of an entire lobe, became the operation of choice for uh, early stage lung cancers. And it, rema and it remains so uh, up until the 1990s. Sublobar resections, like um, a segmentectomy, in which only a segment of the lobe is taken out in an anatomical fashion, and a wedge resection at, in which the tumor is resected along with a bit of lung rim around it in a non anatomical fashion are not usually favored even for, uh, were not even for early stage lung cancers. Even in this group, most of these patients, are, uh, just say larger proportion of patients were instead referred to uh, for stereotactic body graded therapy, uh, popularly known as SABA. But, we are living in a changing world. And uh, there's, uh, we're facing an increasingly changing lung cancer pro patient profile. With the screening on board, we, are, we will hopefully be diagnosing smaller cancers or earlier tumors. We'll probably be required to treat older and frailer patients with lung cancers. And we'll probably find more metachronous second or third cancers as patients with lung cancer survive longer with uh, improved treatments. Usually in patients who have, um, they were frail and old and have, have uh, developed subsequent cancers, SABA is considered a good option. But a recent study in, published in 2020 uh, with a large cohort of patients showed that even sublobar resections like wedge resections or segmentectomies, if, if performed in this population, give a much better overall survival compared to SABA. The thoracic surgical fraternity in, uh, in, in the recent months and years has seen two landmark papers, which have put segmentectomy and wedge resections at par with more extensive operations like lobectomies for lung cancer. Two large randomized control trials, this JCOG0802 and uh, the CLBG trials, uh, each of them with more than 500 patients, compared results of sublobar resections like segmentectomy and wedge resections in suitable early stage peripheral tumors with lobectomies. Both trials found that the disease-free survival was comparable in both groups. The parenchymal preserving approaches uh, operations that have, uh, that have now been uh, in practice have now shown an at least a non-inferior uh, result to lobectomy for early stage peripheral lung cancers. They can help us extend the surgical therapy to an older um, patient population and those with multiple comorbidities. They offer a lower perioperative morbidity and mortality and are likely associated with <coughs> some lung preservation in, uh, in preservation of lung function. 
there's some uh, real life examples of um, real life practice I would like to share from the Northern Hell, which have demonstrated the value of uh, sublobar resections. This is a 42 year old gentleman uh, who is a heavy smoke and a marijuana user uh, who had a biopsy proven lung cancer in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. As you can see, his lung functions were terrible with TLCO of just 30%. But, and he was therefore not a candidate for a lobectomy, but he was also not con uh, considered a candidate for SABA because of his underlying institutional lung disease. He underwent a seg superior segmentectomy and traveled well enough through the operation to be discharged on post-operative day three. This is a 69 year old smoker. She used to get yearly chest x-rays from a uh, the, through her gender practitioner every year since her husband died of lung cancer a, a couple of years ago. But she missed the, the chest x-ray in 2020 due to COVID. In 2021, she was diagnosed with two separate lung cancers, one on each side and early stage. She did not have the lung uh, uh, functions to um, uh, be able to have bilateral lobectomies. So she underwent a left-sided superior segmentectomy of the lower lobe and a right upper lobectomy and travel through treatment very well. So in conclusion, lung cancer patients get the best shot at cure when operated in early stages. The rates of early detection and treatment are still low, but screening might change that. And, I've, and as general practitioners, you probably have a huge role in making the screening worthwhile. Minimal access surgery, and lung parenchyma preservation will make surgical resection available to a wider population. And lastly, the thoracic surgical service at Northern has followed the advances in surgical care and provides quality care to the community we serve. Thank you. And I would like to now hand over to uh, Vish for the last segment of our presentation, the webinar today. About that. Um, so my the last talk for today um, is really just a, an oncologist overview of an update in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. And so just to sort of expand a bit on what um, Bibisha was talking with regards to staging, I just wanted to go through what the current paradigm um, of therapies are and where we're actually starting to move to. Um, yeah. Stage one. Um, basically 1a cancer up to three centimeters stage 1b up to three to four centimeters and node negative um, treatment if they're fit is surgical resection um, plus minus adjuvant chemotherapy based on the tumor profile so for some stage 1b's we do recommend it although it's not um, stock standard part of our therapy um, an alternative is um, steroid active ablative body radiotherapy or SABA if they're not fit for any type of surgical resection. Um, stage 2A, and this is a cancer that's between four and five centimeters, um, or 2B, where you've got um, up to five centimeters with lymph nodes, um, local regional lymph nodes involvement, uh, five to seven centimeters with not in the lymph node or invading structures, um, or less than seven centimeters, but there's more than one tumor in the same node. Um, and again, stage two, if medically fit surgery followed by chemotherapy is the standard. Um, I've put a little caveat there, but if their PDL one is over 50%, they are eligible for one year of adjuvant immunotherapy with atezolizumab. These words probably don't mean anything to any of you, but essentially PDL one is the um, probably one of the only biomarkers that we truly have to determine who might benefit from having immunotherapy in lung cancer. Um, Prior to immunotherapy, we had targeted therapies and chemotherapy, but immunotherapy has come as a bit of a um, recent add to the list of 
weapons that the oncologist has. And for patients with a high PDL1, which is deemed to be over 50%, immunotherapy um, adds a significant benefit, which is sometimes even more than chemo. And again, if they're not fit for surgery, then um, the usual treatment would be radical radiotherapy or chemo radiation. Stage three, so this is where you're starting to get more lymph node involvement or more complex disease within the lungs. Um, and so that divides with 3A, 3B. And then again, if the nodal stations involved are the um, N2 or N3, um, and 3C, which very often is pretty close to being stage four, as it's not really, um, unless it's um, specific circumstances can't be really treated the same as a 3A, 3B. And so in stage three, a, certainly we can look at surgery in selected cases um, in fit patients followed by adjuvant chemotherapy in the same paradigm. But more likely the blanket rule for stage three is um, chemoradiotherapy followed by one year of adjuvant immunotherapy with a different drug called Devalimab, which is based on a specific trial. Um, so the changes that are coming, and obviously the first one has already now made it on PBS as of the 1st of November, which is adjuvant atezolizumab in resected stage two to three A. Um, with a PDL on score of over 50%, and we'll talk a bit about that. Another group is that of adjuvant ozimertinib. Ozimertinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor targeted for EGFR mutated non small cell lung cancer. Um, and that data has been around longer than most, but is not available yet to us. And um, thirdly, one of the more exciting areas that's evolving how we're thinking about lung cancer is the concept of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and immunotherapy in stage 1b to 3a. So neoadjuvant meaning that these patients receive their treatment prior to a surgical resection. So the first um, set I'd like to talk about is the EMPOWER10 trial, which is um, essentially a trial looking at adding adjuvant atezolizumab, which is an immunotherapy drug, um, for one year versus observation following resection. It was stratified according to pdl one status, histology, and stage. Um, so importantly, um, on this, it's a busy looking slide, but I've just summarized it in the box. About 18% of patients who ended up on atezolizumab stopped due to adverse events. Um, eight people died in the study group versus three in the control arm. Four of those were directly linked to atezolizumab. So the reason I highlight this is that Immunotherapy is not benign. It does carry significant risk of side effects. We, the initial trials reported a seven to ten percent chance of a significant adverse reaction with them. Um, in real world, this is sitting closer to the twenty to thirty percent mark, and so eighteen percent is unfortunately within what um, we do see. Um, and obviously, anyone who gets a severe life-altering side effect or someone who dies on a uh, study for a curable cancer is um, it's very important to ensure that we are doing the right thing by the patient. Um, these curves essentially just support that um, basically overall everyone benefited from having the um, atezolizumab um, versus having just observation. The difference being um, that the higher PDL1 status um, which was the one over 50% probably had the best benefit in the subgroup analysis. So in the current landscape, it's approved in the US for any resected uh, 1B23A PDL1 greater than 1%. It's been approved in Australia for uh, PDL1 over 50%. Um, the um, PBS has a very strict rule, which is a once per lifetime indication for immunotherapy in lung cancer. Um, and that's, um, it's a roadblock, but there's a rational reason for this. These drugs are extremely expensive and it's up to um, 10 to 12,000 per cycle of treatment. So think about that for a year. And also in the advanced setting, it does carry on for longer. So the potential of increasing the cure rate and therefore reducing the burden on the healthcare system as well. It has been PBS listed as of the 1st of November, but the problem with a lot of these studies is it's very exciting, but there's no actual overall survival data yet. So we're um, going on recurrence-free survival um, and sometimes the overall survival might not match this. Um, the ADORA study, which looked at adjuvant ozimertinib um, versus placebo. So this was a double-blinded study Resected stage 2 to 3A, they did have stage 1Bs in there as well. Um, 
with patients with an EGFR mutation. So EGFR mutations happen in about, depending on the population, um, I think in an Australian average, it'd be probably about 10 to 14% of lung cancers. Um, in a uh, Southeast Asian population, it's up to 60 to 70%. It's more common in non-smokers. And um, the, their therapy has very much been dictated by the EGFR mutation inhibitors, which are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Ozimertinib, which is uh, the sort of latest generation version of this, has the best overall survival data in um, the metastatic setting. So interestingly, in this situation, these patients were allowed to have adjuvant chemotherapy, but it was not mandatory. So 60% had it, so 40% of the patients on this trial didn't actually have chemotherapy at all. Um, and the results are actually even more impressive than um, the immunotherapy trial, and showing clearly that when you have a driver mutation, targeting the drive definitely improves things. So their disease-free survival much, much better with um, ozimertinib with um, median has not even been reached yet. So unfortunately, again, this is approved in the US, not in Australia. There is an access program. Um, I asked recently for a patient and the cost quoted was about $250,000 for the duration of treatment. It's a three-year treatment plan, but the cost is roughly about $8,000 a month. Um, given how big the benefit is, we're hoping this will get PBS registration and the overall survival has also been published now and it's also positive. Um, which brings us to the third one, which is Checkmate 816, which probably the most recent study. So this is looking at new adjuvant chemotherapy and nivolumab, which is immunotherapy versus chemotherapy alone followed by resection. So preoperative treatment is a fairly new concept in Australia. It's not something that we've done a lot of. Um, there's centers in the US and in Europe that actually um, almost exclusively treat with new adjuvant therapy. We haven't as a general rule as um, the response rate to chemotherapy have not been fantastic and um, it potentially could compromise the curative surgical resection. Um, so one of the key things they were looking at was about a complete response rate. So a complete response is when you cut out the tumor and everything has been killed by the treatment. Um, so a pathological complete response in our mind represents potentially cure, as in long-term outcome if there's no cancer detectable at the end. And so Chemotherapy alone had a 2.2% um, pathological complete response versus 24% with the addition of nivolumab. The, the really nice thing about this trial is they only gave four doses, so four doses of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and they didn't give anything afterwards. So the full benefit of um, what comes next is realistically from those four doses. Um, and again, it, um, the event-free survival rate is significant as well which is not surprising given the scale of benefit of the pathological complete responders. And it was very much seen across every subgroup. And survival, which obviously has not matured yet because this is a very recent study, is starting to show a separation of the curves, showing that the combination is superior to chemotherapy alone. So it is an exciting trial given the results. It is potentially going to shift our way of thinking about what is defined as resectable versus not, and also whether or not, once we get access to this, um, having the new adjuvant treatment might be a better um, balance of giving um, therapy, effective therapy, and also finding out if it works or not. There was a very low rate of adverse events, probably because they only got four doses of immunotherapy and very low rates of immune-mediated adverse events. It's not available yet, but um, once survival data matures, it potentially will become a standard of care. Um, and just lastly, I wanted to run through, because you've heard a lot about what can be done um, for the patients now at the Northern. I just wanted to run through a, a little clinical viet of one of our patients, just to sort of highlight how many things have changed since he started. So AE, 36 year old man, who's a smoker with a 20 pack year history, uh, 15 marijuana bongs a day, background of bipolar disorder, previous IV drug use, um, on then quetiapine and suboxone. He initially presented in March of this year with hemoptysis, had a CT chest which showed a cavitating lung lesion, um, which is shown there with the uh, baller next to it. So this was deemed to be high risk for percutaneous biopsy. So he proceeded to a PET staging and radial EBUS. So he had a PET on the 17th of March. PET essentially shows an avid primary lesion, 
potentially an avid lymph node um, uh, in the N2 region, but also uh, suspicious activity next to his esophagus for lymph node involvement as well. You have the radial EBUS, which confirmed uh, lung cancer, which was PDL1 90%, negative for any driver mutation and uh, on extended mutation testing as well. So it was discussed at our MDM on 28th of April, and the update in media stardom was concerning for um, more nodal disease, and there was robust discussion about the upfront surgery versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And at the time, we had limited evidence for the benefit of neoadjuvant, so the decision was made for surgery first. So he went on to have a left upper lobectomy and mediastinal node dissection on the 5th of May. And surprisingly, this came back being a lot worse than what we thought. So it ended up being a 42 millimeter pleomorphic carcinoma with um, one lymph node involved 40 millimeters in size with extranodal extension, um, which puts him at a stage 3A. So we discussed his case at the MDM afterwards and he went on to chemotherapy and also radiotherapy, given the um, external extension of the lymph node. This is not standard of care, but it was thought due to his age, we wanted to give him the best possible chance. Um, so he completed his chemotherapy and then his adjuvant radiotherapy only last month. And during the course of his adjuvant treatment, atezolizumab has become available initially on a free access program and is now PBS listed. And so he started this on the 10th of November, um, very recently. So just to highlight the changes that are happening as we're actually treating patients. And I think that's actually my last slide. Thanks everyone. Um, Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat. Has anyone got any questions for our speakers that they'd like to ask? Um, please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom. having trouble accessing the Q&A box, you can pop it in the chat. Oh, no, we do have a question. Um, not on this, uh, sorry, are we to screen now is the question that's come through? Um, no, um, so short answer is, so this is now a positive recommendation, um, which now needs to be approved by the government. So I think the likelihood of um, screening is probably within the next three years. There's no further questions. Um, I might say thank you so much to all of our speakers for that session. Oh, sorry. One more question. Um, if someone wants to pay, would you order the tests is the question. Um, I think if you've got someone who's high risk, um, the data certainly supports it, um, having a low dose CT. The problem is that um, how, how do you interpret results? So at the moment, we don't have a standardized approach on how these lung nodules are reported. So when the screening program goes live, my understanding is there will be training provided to actually classify these nodules into low, medium, high risk, which we don't technically have right now. So right now, anything you find will be done according to standard uh, Flaschner criteria. I think, however, if you have a high risk patient, my personal view would be they're high risk, most likely because of a smoking history. So tackling that as an issue as well. Um, and certainly you can do it. Um, I don't know what um, Kanishka and Bibishal think about it, but I think the evidence does back it. Yeah, look, look obviously, if it's back screening, um, I think you have to be careful with the patient. If a patient wants to pay for something, or I think you need to really take into that clinical context and ensure that they fit the criteria for screening, because um, you know you can. Um, you can, as we mentioned before, sort of nodules can be multifactorial, really very broad differential. So I think um, we, we, you might find a nodule that needs a bit of follow up or not, but in, in someone that's young, it might not. It might just be an incidental finding, um, which is of, of no significance, and you might. I mean, you know, you have to go at the the, the 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 radiation and that sort of thing if you're doing it in a cohort that's not of high risk. So I think that's that's really important to think about.
Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Um, in, in the high risk population, there is certainly the data that supports the survival benefit. So, yeah. Um, we've got another question. Uh, which system do you use for subsolid nodule classification, RADs or Brock calculator? Um, I'll look for subsolid. You can use either or. I'd, I'd, I'd usually use the Fleischler sort of to guide sort of decision making around surveillance. But generally, if there's then a change in that appearance, then um, you'd push towards a biopsy and, and look subsolid nodules are probably a bit harder than solid nodules because um, they, they, they are sometimes harder to biopsy as well so um so they can be a bit tricky but i think look, I, don't, I don't really have a preference for one calculator or the other we might leave it there we're right on eight o'clock um, thank you to all of our speakers for your presentation tonight. Uh, I can see that in the chat um, we've popped the survey monkey link for the feedback survey for this session. Um, we'd appreciate if you could please fill that out and give us your feedback. Um, and a follow-up email will be sent to all of you with um, the resources for this session and the recording. Um, Otherwise, thanks everyone. Have a very good evening. Um, and if you're interested in future events, please always have a look on the PHM website for our upcoming events for the rest of the year. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you for holding, yeah, getting this webinar on. Thank you.